If you didn't listen to last week's episode, then press stop and go back to that one now. You'll meet Jeff Spearin, the global whiskey ambassador for the Dublin Liberties Distillery. Once you know all about Jeff, then you're ready to take our tour. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. Welcome to hell. Not your usual greeting, except when you are in the Liberty section of Dublin. Why was it known as hell? You'll just have to find out on this episode of Lush Life. Jeff will guide us through Dublin's newest distillery and then take us through a tasting of a selection of the Dublin Liberties Distillery range of Irish whiskeys. What a way to end the year. But first, don't forget, you still have to buy Prezi's for your nearest and dearest. No worries, you can head over to LushLifeCocktailTours.com to buy tickets for the tastiest tour in town. Everyone will be sipping cocktails in some of the most famous bars in London, all while learning about Soho's drinking history. It's the best gift for that drinking companion in your life. Now, let's get on with that tour. We're starting the tour. We are starting the tour. Hello, I'm Jeff Spearin, and I'm the Global Whiskey Ambassador here at the Dublin Liberties Distillery. So you're very, very welcome. Uh, you're in an area known as Hell, so welcome to Hell. You'll see the sign. You won't see the sign, but you'll hear the sign. Uh, The Liberties area was famously known as hell by the locals back in the early 1800s. Uh, It was an area known for its kind of danger and debauchery, full of criminals, but also craftsmen. And we're going to showcase today a little element of both of those things. So uh, you're standing in the older part of the building that we're in. So we've rejuvenated a 400-year-old building, uh, all with the original stonework. And I love the duality between... The old, and the, what we're going to go into is the brand new working distillery, which is exactly like modern day Irish whiskey. So we're combining the old and the new always together. So keep an eye out for all of those elements as we walk through the building. Uh, the Liberties area is famed, has a hell of a lot of history, and we're going to talk about that in the next room, which is our water room. So this is our wall of awards, and all of our whiskies are award winning. Uh, we haven't updated the mo- this wall just yet. There's actually five more medals to go on this, uh, all gold medals as well. So the whiskies that we're going to try later on are all gold medal winning whiskies. And in fact, one of the whiskies just won a gold medal at the Irish Whiskey Awards, which is essentially the Oscars of Irish whiskey, which is fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Take a seat inside. We are in the Dublin Liberties Distillery and in our very famous and hugely important water room. Okay, so water is a key ingredient in Irish whiskey. It's one of the five ingredients, five main ingredients in whiskey, water, barley or grains, yeast, and then the two most important are wood and thyme. Not the, not the herb, but actual duration. We need our whiskey to be aged, minimum of three years. Our ambition is to do it much longer than that. But before we get into too much details, what I'd like to do is give you a welcome drink, which is our honeycomb liqueur. This is Dubliner Irish whiskey, so barrel aged whiskey infused with caramel and honeycomb, 30% ABV. So it's nice and light and it reminds me of like a kind of crunchy, delicious little uh, dram as well. So enjoy it, it's to be savoured. Cheers, sláinte. Oh my god, that is so good. So good, isn't it? It's, uh, literally that is like people, so I've been doing this for a long time and I do a lot of whiskey shows. People will say, I don't like liqueurs. I said, I don't care if you don't like liqueurs. This is not your typical liqueur. Uh, you'll see people like, I only drink peated Scotch whiskey from the Highlands. And you're like, okay, fine, that's no problem. And then 20 minutes later, they'll come back. I heard you've got this delicious liqueur. Can I please try some? And you're like, yes. So it is, uh, it is infectious. It's indulgent. And it is a perfect intro to the world of whiskey. So when we're trying to con- talk to people about whiskey, which can be quite standoffish, we're both we're trying to demystify it, but also at the same time make it accessible. And that is the most accessible whiskey, albeit a liqueur, in the world. So you're in our water room, okay? And we've dedicated a room to water for a number of reasons. It is hugely influential in the overall flavor profile of your end product, which is whiskey. But also here at the Dublin Liberties Distillery, what makes us different from our neighboring distilleries in Dublin is that we have a natural borehole, a well, 100 feet below this building that we utilize to 
using our mashing and to dilute our end product before we create whiskey. So um, in this area, it's quite common to have hard water, which is great for porters and stouts. We've got some very famous brewing neighbors in the Guinness storehouse across the road, but it's not so good for, for whiskey. And Dublin is famous for that. So what, the water that we use actually comes from about 25 kilometers outside um, in the Dublin mountains. And then there's an underground river called the River Poddle, which flows uh, through this area. And there's a natural well below that. So we tap into that and we're the only distillery within this region that can do that, which is fantastic. And ultimately that will make a big difference in terms of the mineral content that's in that um, versus the other distilleries around us. Now we do treat that on site uh, and bring it to a little bit more of an acceptable level, but that will give us a real Dublin Liberties characteristic, uh, which, which hopefully will make some really good whiskey later on. The other hugely important part of this room is that we like to tell people about the history of the Liberties. Okay? So back in the early 1800s and 1900s, Irish whiskey was the pinnacle of all things whiskey. It, it was 60 to 70% of the global market and Dublin was the epicenter of that. So much so that people used to actually say that their whiskey was from Dublin even though it wasn't. So they would say, you know, Jeff Spearin's whiskey from Dublin, and then in the bottom right hand corner it would say, actually from Belfast. <laughs> so it was valued around 25% higher, the Queen of England drank Irish whiskey, the Russian Tsars drank Irish whiskey, and Liberties was hugely, uh, I mean, the main, the main aspect of that. So you would have had 37 distilleries within this region, there's only four now, you would have had hundreds of breweries, okay? Now the significance of the name Liberties, as you can probably guess, echoes to some degree of freedom. And the liberty that we're in is of St. Thomas Abbey. It's so really in the 1800s, right? You would have had Dublin, which was called the uh, part of Dublin known as the Pale, which is where a lot of the wealthy people would have lived. And outside of the Pale was sort of the rest of Dublin. And essentially, outside of those old city walls, which originates from kind of Dublin Castle outwards, which is very close to where we're currently standing, uh, you would have had all the smelly stuff. So breweries, tanneries, distilleries, they were all kicked out into the liberties, which is why we had so many. Now, Back then, you had to have a license to brew beer, even bake bread, okay? Now, we're on Mill Street. This building was previously a mill, so we're, as I said earlier, it's 400 years old, and we've rejuvenated one of those buildings. And you can see, with the well below us, why it was utilized as such, and why it's probably stood the test of time. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a mill, but it was also a tannery, where they used to skin animal pelts. When we were digging up the ground, we found the old pits as well, which is fantastic. We have a brand called The Dead Rabbit Irish Whiskey. We only found out that this was a tannery after we launched that, so perhaps it was fate. Maybe it was supposed to be. Now, the Liberties area was uh, notoriously known amongst its locals, uh, and our brands, uh, and our, our whiskies rather, sorry, our whiskies are named after significant folklore, places, parts, people of the Liberties area. So we have Oak Devil, Copper Alley, Murder Lane, Keeper's Coin, and the King of Hell. Now I can guarantee you this isn't off the Scrabble, okay? These names didn't just come out of our heads. These are hugely significant. And when we sit down to do the tasting, I'm gonna guide you through each and every one of those and explain the stories. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move into the next room, which is our milling, our mashing, and our fermentation room. And it is quite a beast. So if you wanna follow me all the way down to the end of the room. As I said, it's a, a fully operational distillery, so any bangs and dings, hoses you might hear, and um, oh well, we're mashing in as well, which is fantastic. So if you have a look in there, you'll see our grain, our 100% malted barley, just steeping in some warm water there, and our ambition is to extract all those lovely sugars and enzymes and starches and everything else. So, okay. I touched on one thing earlier, which was the importance of water here in the Dublin Liberties Distillery. And the second most important ingredient, of course, is our cereals. What we're gonna do is only distill 100% malted barley from the island of Ireland, right? Now, we're not gonna focus on terroir too much, but all of the barley that we utilize has been grown in Ireland and then um, malted on the island of Ireland as well, right? Which will give us a really distinctive flavor profile as we move to it later on. Now, 
what happens is we get about 30 tonnes of malted barley delivered to us every two or three weeks. We leave it here in a silo and then we mill that down. Okay. 30 tonnes of malted barley arrives into our distillery every two to three weeks. And what we do is we grind that down, removing any uh, stems and sticks and stones or any like that, because what we want is the malted barley. Now we turn that into a kind of a coarse uh, powder known as grist. And what we do is we bring that through a, a small uh, line arm into our six ton mash vessel here. Okay, so it's a full lauder ton. And what we'll do is over the course of six hours, we will add two tons of our grist, our malted barley, to 10,000 liters of water. Now, in this vessel here, that you can't, again, you can't see, but it's very impressive, uh, we will hydrate all of the grist uh, just in here beforehand. So that accumulates about 4,000 liters of water. And then over the period of, of six hours, we'll sparge in uh, certain quantities of water to get to 10,000 liters. Why 10,000 liters? Well, we have five washbacks that each have a capacity of 20,000 liters. Now, we only ever want to half fill those because our wash still is 10,000 liters. So, what we have is this beautiful sugary liquid known as wort. Okay, the initial runnings off are actually too dense in sugar, and if we added yeast to them, we would uh, it wouldn't actually. Uh, it wouldn't garnish a very strong yield, it wouldn't produce enough alcohol, the yeast wouldn't be as effective. So, we sparge in an additional amount of water, okay? That seeps through our grain, and it uh, takes on the last bits of sugar, the last enzymes, and then brings us to a much more stable condition for the yeast to survive. Now, what's left in our mash tun is basically spent grain. But, we're very sustainable here in Ireland, and we like to go full 360 degrees. So, we give this to farmers, Okay, they feed their livestock with that, and of course we eat the livestock, so all very good. We drink the whiskey, we eat the livestock, it's all very good. Um, now, what people don't often know is that fermenting is probably the longest period within, the, within whiskey distillation. Typically, this will be, um, go between 52 to 60 odd hours, however, we're in no rush here in the Dublin Liberties Distillery, and we go for 70 to 77 hours. Now, what does that do? It allows the yeast the most amount of time to gobble up all those sugars and turn them into distillable alcohols because alcohols are what we want to concentrate when we get into distillation. Now, the five vessels that you see here, we've got the three big boys in the back and we've got the two little ones here. The only reason for the difference in size and shape is because of the building that we're in. It's quite narrow, as you can see here. Every one of these was craned in over the original 400-year-old building that you walk through in order to get here. Quite an operation, <laughs> all right? Uh, then we have a hot water tank here, and then the very last one in the back is a pot ale charger. Again, that is based on heat efficiency, and it's one of the uh, a hugely driving factor in allowing us to be cost effective and once again sustainable, because they're the, they're the big factors that we want to be able to do. We don't want to be um, throwing away energy as, as much as we can, which is, which is not ideal. So we use a super M strain of yeast as well, which is quite interesting, and it gives us an, uh, a wash alcohol percentage of about 7.3, 7.5% ABV. Typically it's about eight, okay? Um, the varying ABVs will give you different flavors, which ultimately will then be concentrated as you go through. So you'll see um, and smell and hear the distillation process, but you'll also be able to see the, the light and the floral nature of the spirit that we're gonna go into as well. Above us, we have some half barrels that we've used to decorate the room. One of my favorite stories is that when we brought the Irish Revenue Board in here, they asked us to drill a hole in every single one to prove that we weren't illicitly storing whiskey in our distillery. So um, I can guarantee you we're not illicitly storing whiskey, but it's just one of those cool stories that I think are always interesting to tell. We have a, an amazing distillery team here uh, comprised of four individuals. So John, so Daryl, well, five actually, Daryl McNally is our master distiller. We have John Park, who is our um, is a distillery manager, and then we have a team of three. So we have uh, Trina, Megan, and Paul, who look after all the distillation here in the Dublin Liberty Distillery. So a great team who have been tirelessly trying to uh, operate this building and getting it up to maximum efficiency. One of the interesting things here, right, is that when you look in, it doesn't look like much is happening, but actually the rotating arm in there is doing two revolutions per minute. That's very, very slow. Okay, again, we like to take our time, both in the fermentation and in the mashing. 
And with two revolutions per minute, we don't agitate the grains overly, and it allows a natural breakdown of those starches and those enzymes that are hugely influential for our fermentation and ultimately our distillation as well. Because if we get it wrong here, we get it wrong everywhere else. So this is hugely important to us. We're leaving milling, mashing and fermentation and we're coming into the most visually beautiful room in the distillery. Actually, the bar is also beautiful, but to me, because of because we know what happens in here, it's both beautiful aesthetically and in terms of its, if its production abilities as well. So, let me introduce you to our three beautiful copper pot stills, the three ladies of the liberties. Now, whiskey is extremely sensorial, right? So what we've experienced in the previous room is that beautiful grain, that beautiful cereal mashing in. What we're now getting is that light and that floral, new make spirit being distilled in here. Now it is quite loud. We've got all three stills running. I talked about them being the three ladies of the liberties. So we've named each and every one of our stills. So up first is our wash still. It's 10,000 liters and it is Lucy Tench. Right? Lucy Tench was the owner of this building when it was a tannery about 200 odd years ago. And what we like to do is pay homage to her. So we have honored that by naming her the very first still in our 10,000 liter wash. The second one is Darky Kelly, a very famous, how can I put this, lady of the night in Dublin's history. She owned 21 brothels around Dublin at a time when it was the second biggest red light district in all of Europe. Hamburg was actually the biggest back then. And last but not least, of course, is the very, very famous, do you want to take a guess? Molly Malone, Molly Malone, of course, of course. Now each of the stills that you see here have been made by hand. It took 700 hours and it was built by a company in Germany called Carl. Now these stills traveled 1500 kilometers in order to get here. We brought a team of expert engineers over to install each and every one of these. But again, they had to be craned in over that original building. The day that we had the team here, it was too windy. Okay, the three stills cost about three million quid. <laughs> so we didn't want to ding them off walls. So it cost us 20,000 euro to keep the team over here for one extra night. And that was just the bar tab. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> we, honest to God, it took, it, took, it took a tremendous amount of effort and work to get these in here. But they are some of the most beautiful stills I've ever seen. Now, the colors vary. And that is because copper is an amazing conductor of heat and over a period of time they will adopt and develop a more crimson kind of copper color. In our wash still, this takes about six hours. We bring in our 10,000 liters of wash from the fermenters, which is about 7.3, 7.5% alcohol by volume ABV. What happens is then we have a jacket here. This silver jacket, okay, has steam pipes within it. Now those steam pipes get this entire still up to about 90 degrees Celsius. Water and alcohol have two different boiling points. Water at 100 degrees, which hopefully we all know. Alcohol around 78 degrees Celsius. Okay, now Fahrenheit, I'll let you fill that one in later on. I don't know my Fahrenheit very well. Two amazing things about these stills. One, you can look in. So we've got glass windows so that you can really get a look and feel as, as to what's happening during distillation. And ultimately, distillation is a very straightforward process. It's based on evaporation and then condensing it back into a liquid and strengthening the alcohols and removing the less strong alcohols. So the shape and the size of these stills are all very, very deliberate. Um, what you have at the very top is the line arm or the swan's neck. And the shape of this allows for a very lighter, more floral forward alcohol because alcohols of course have different weights and heights if you think of the, the standard periodic table um, helium being the lightest and everything else being heavier alcohols are very much in the same boat so th this will give us an ultimately final spirit of really really very light and floral as I said which we're going to try later on so from this first distillation we hit about 21% alcohol by volume okay now we put 10,000 liters in you only get 4,000 liters worth of actual spirit out. But once again, it doesn't go to waste. What's left in the remaining thing is called pot ale. Now it serves us two purposes. Purpose number one is we put it in our pot ale charger for the next time we want to use the distillation. So our wash is about 17 to 22 degrees Celsius, okay, which is quite cold. We want to get it up quite hot beforehand. So what we, and this pot ale is quite hot. 
So what we do is before we distill, we have a heat exchange between the pot ale and our wash. So that by the time the wash enters this distillation, it's about 60 degrees Celsius. Saving time, saving fuel, and most importantly, saving money. Okay, so the second thing is once we've used that pot ale, we then also give that to farmers. But because it's been in touch with copper contact, it can't be uh, fed to cows. So it's actually sheep and pigs and goats uh, can, can have that no problem at all, which is quite interesting. You learn crazy things in this building. Uh, we've also got these amazing spirit safes. Now they are from four sites in Scotland, so we haven't totally ignored the influence of the Scottish. They're good for a few things in fairness to them. And what this gives you a good idea of is the cuts, the various cuts that we're doing. Um, obviously, traditionally, spirit safes were used as a form of taxation. Uh, the tax man would have come to your distillery, taken a reed, and uh, known how many litres of pure alcohol you've produced, and been able to tax you accordingly. Of course, nowadays, we're slightly more civilised and slightly more ahead of the curve in Ireland than people might want to believe, and this is all done uh, electronically. However, they still make a really strong visual asset, and they're also hugely important as, as telling the story of, of the history of Irish whisky. Now, moving on to our second distillation, we have um, 6,000 litre low wines uh, still here, and essentially what, what happens is we're re-strengthening that 21% alcohol from the previous distillation. Okay? This gets a little bit hotter than the previous run, but also it goes to about six, sorry, also it runs for about six hours uh, once again. Traditionally in Scotland, but not always, they'll stop here. And in fact, in some Irish distilleries, they also stop here. People say, all Irish whiskey must be triple distilled, Jeff. Complete lie. Um, in fact, we may double distill later in the future, and that is why we have a 10,000 litre wash and two 6,000 litre stills and it'll give a very different flavor profile. The, one of the benefits of double distillation is that you get a really a heavier, much oilier um, style of whiskey, which for me, I enjoy. Uh, triple distillation, of course, is, a little, is that little bit lighter, and it's something you can expect from us in the near future, but don't rule out double distillation just yet. As a result of, double, as a result of the second distillation, we have a ABV of about 69%. Okay. Now we put 6,000 litres in, we only get about 4,500 litres out, the rest is spent lees, and that is just low ABV that we don't really use, and that is effluent, and we get rid of that, so it's not important. Very last distillation, as I said, in our Molly Malone, for me is, is, is fantastic, because as you can see here from the glass, our distillery team still manually come out here and make the cuts. So with whiskey, you've got heads, a hearts, and a tails. Now the heads is um, kind of toxic alcohols to humans, methanol and what have you. So back in the day, they actually used to get a, a, a jug and literally take it off the barrel and throw that away. So that, uh, there's a name for it, I can't quite remember it. Anyway, but the skill of a distiller is based on the cuts, right? So um, our team actually come out here to make their cuts. And I've been lucky enough to join them on a couple of occasions and it's incredible. They sit you down, right, and over a series of 20 minute periods, they get you to try different new make spirits, and you go, yeah, that's okay. It's all right, it's quite, quite tasty. Wow, this is good. Oh my God, this is absolutely insane. Oh, it's okay, oh, it's all right. Oh wow, this is raw eggs. So if you let your distillation run too long, you let that raw egginess kind of into your spirits, and ultimately that's gonna affect what you do and how your whiskey is gonna finish up. So we are distilling to our average take in is about 84.6% alcohol by volume, right? But don't worry, we're not gonna try that. That's quite high. What a lot of distilleries will do is, they'll send that off to their warehouses to be put into barrels. However, not all distilleries have an incredible water source like we do. Now, everything in Dublin Liberties is all about Dublin. And so we reuse that water source, we demineralize it completely so it has no effect and we lower that alcohol down to 63%. That is what we then barrel our whiskey at. Our whiskey is matured in uh, the south of Ireland, so a little bit further away from Dublin. And we do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, land in Dublin is super expensive, okay? Uh, warehousing requires a lot of space, which in Dublin we do not have. It's the third smallest region in all of Ireland, and it makes up about 50% of the entire population of the country. Secondly, Casks are porous, they breathe. What, what do we want them to breathe in? City air or seaside country air? I'll let you decide. Now, 
The other thing you're going to see here is two different types of barrels. Above our heads are American bourbon casks. American bourbon is hugely important for the maturation of Irish whiskey. Because of American bourbon laws, they can only use these barrels once. Okay? What they do with them then is they sell them to people like us, which is great. And we can mature our whiskey in them. So these are 200 liters. And it's just to give people an idea of the size of the barrels. However, as you see here, this is our baby barrel. Okay? This is handmade by a company called Kelvin Cooperage. And it's virgin American oak. Virgin American oak imparts a tremendous amount of flavor and color. And being 100 liters, do you think it's going to be faster or slower in maturation? I know this is a trick question. Slower. Faster. Oh, I was going to say. Yeah, it's faster because you've got more contact between wood and whiskey. We're the only Irish whiskey See, I company. I thought it was going to be a trick I know, I know. We're the only Irish whiskey company uh, using 100 liter virgin American casks. And that in itself is innovative. And you're going to see a couple of more innovative tricks up our sleeve as we go into tasting the whiskey. So in the still Molly Malone, one of the things that's really interesting in one of the windows is you can see this sort of oily dripping effect like, like rain cascading down a window. And that is essentially the oils refluxing back down the still, coating the entire distillation. And one of the things that's most interesting is it forms a film over the very top. So as everything is bubbling and boiling away, it actually passes through this film, taking more flavor up as it evaporates, and that gets caught in the line arm and then condense back down. So again, the shape has hugely influenced our final whiskey profile, which is the amazing thing that you can go to hundreds of distilleries, see hundreds of styles of shapes and what have you, and they all give a different profile and flavor. Hopefully ours is the best. <laughs> we are leaving distillation and what we're gonna do next is talk about maturation, right? Now we don't do that on site, but it is hugely important and we like to give a little bit of detail to all our guests. Now what you'll notice is we're leaving the brand new modern part of our distillery and coming back into that old building. And it's just another cue into seeing there's literally, I mean, there's glue and wood, there's granite, slate, sandstone, red brick. And even if you look further down here, they've actually pulled railway lines out of the street and used them to keep this building standing over 400 years. So just to give you another idea in terms of the lengths they went to to keep this building standing, and a testament to why we've kept it uh, alive as well. So I said that the distillation room was one of the most aesthetically pleasing rooms. This bar is also very, very much one of the most aesthetically pleasing rooms. It, it serves many functions. Maturation room, tasting room, bar, my second home. And you'll see why I spend a lot of time in here in a second. So you're very, very welcome to the Dublin Liberty Distillery maturation room and bar. What we're standing in is where we talk about maturation. Now, maturation is hugely important in whiskey because if you get the base spirit right, okay, good wood will give you 60 to 70% of the flavor. Right? Hugely, hugely important. Now, we use a range of types of styles of wood here at the Dublin Liberty Distillery. Of course, we use the very best American bourbon casks. We use virgin American wood. We use European wines, French wines, certain indigenous wines, different styles of wood uh, that are also quite irregular um, and because, because we're constantly trying to innovate within the category. And in older whiskies, there is not a lot left in the barrel. And that's because of a thing called the angel's share. Now, I spoke earlier about casks being porous. So one of the things they do is they breathe in, but like all of us, they also breathe out. And two of the things they breathe out are alcohol and water. So the reduction levels in the cask happen over a period of time. Now in Kentucky, it'll be a lot higher, but in Ireland, it's about 2% per annum, okay, which is great. So we've got a really good climate where we get a fantastic amount of interaction between wood and whiskey, which gives us flavor. So that contraction and expansion over time. But what many people don't realize is that Ireland, and indeed where we mature our whiskey down south of Dublin, is actually a lot warmer than certain parts of, say, Scotland. So when you see 10-year-old Irish whiskey, it isn't correlated to 10-year-old Scottish whiskey because under 4 degrees Celsius, you have very little interaction between wood and whiskey. And of course, that's where a lot of the flavor comes from. So when we can get that kind of hotter temperature for longer, more interaction, more flavor, which is why American whiskeys very mature really quickly. Australian whiskeys, Indian whiskeys, they don't need to, to, to spend as much time in a barrel as, as we do in Ireland. So that's a couple of benefits as well. Now, um, 
For those of you looking in the room, we have a lot of visual cues. We have old barrels here that we like to discuss and talk to people about because when we get our barrels in from our American bourbon distilleries, we like to give them a little bit of a toasting. Okay, we don't overly char any of the barrels. And what that little toasting does is it reactivates the wood. Now, it's not going to give a smoky flavor profile, but it does reactivate the kind of uh, vanillin compounds, which shockingly provides some vanilla flavor. Um, as well. Okay. Last thing I'm going to say about the maturation room is we've got our beautiful Dublin lobster pot lampshades, which for me remind me a lot about growing up because you would have seen these all down the quays um, or the, the you know along the riverbeds in, in Dublin. And when they threw these in, I was just like, this is my childhood looking at these things. So uh, a lot of little things that you mightn't realise on first glance, but every detail attention to detail here is, is is magnificent and these are some of the comfiest bar stools you'll possibly ever see again probably why i spend a lot of time in here so one of the really interesting parts about this is i touched on the fact that we're on mill street so this is clearly previously a mill and above our heads is a white crane now this is part of the original building and there's actually a trap door at the front now i wouldn't recommend opening it and walking outside because you'll fall from a two-story building but this is all part of the original building where they would have hand pulled up the grain from outside traveled along this crane into the back of the room and that's where they would have made the flour where the monks were legally allowed to bake their own bread because it was the liberties so all comes full circle jeff ended the tour in the tasting room not only did i learn his singular tasting technique but I got to try six spirits in their range. Have a listen and decide which one is for you. We're trying the Liberty's portfolio um, because it's the most premium and it's always aged, always premium. So each one of these has an age statement. We have three ranges within the Dublin Liberty Distillery. We have the Dubliner range, which is all about accessibility, palatability, approachability. We have the Dead Rabbit, which is a collaboration whiskey with the uh, co-founders of the Dead Rabbit Bar in New York. So that was an amazing project to be a part of. And also we have our Liberties range. So um, this is kind of single malt territory, in, innovative cask finishing, and provides a tremendous amount of flavor. Now I spoke about in the water room that each one of these whiskies is, is somewhat named after something significant. I also mentioned that we have a 2,700 euro bottle called the King of Hell, which would cost you 300 euro a shot in the bar. And I brought some with us today. So I have sneakily found a bottle uh, and I've got a little bit of this liquid and this is something special that we're going to try as well. So each of these are significant for me. Um, when I joined the company three years ago, we had some Dubliner whiskey and we were launching the Liberty. So the Oak Devil had been launched, but my second day in the business was this Copper Alley launch. So I always hold this a little bit dearer to the heart. Oak Devil, the name comes from the fact that Within the Liberties area, there are several entrances, several archways that you could have traveled through in order to get here. Now, what I spoke about earlier is that this was known as an area known as Hell. Okay? Who looks after Hell? The devil. And carved out of oak was a devilish figure that hung on the archway into the Liberties area that the locals called the Oak Devil. So whiskey for me is always about storytelling, it's always about sharing ideas, and that's why we wanted to bring the Oak Devil back to life. Cool thing about the whiskies is that they all sort of look after the times that people drink, okay? The occasions that people drink around. And we worked with uh, Board Bia, the Irish Food and Drink Board here in Ireland. Sorry, they actually did a lot of this research themselves, to be honest. They, uh, they did a sample of about 2,000 people in the US, uh, Singapore, Japan, and China to figure out how, when do people drink whiskey and how do they drink whiskey. And of course, they drink it neat, they drink it cocktails, they drink it whichever way they want, but when and how. And they figured out that there were six key times that people drink whiskey. All right, so bear with me on this. It was to unwind, to connect, to energize, and then indulge, impress, and explore. And within these whiskey ranges, we're trying to cover off all those things. Okay? So unwind, of course, you come in from a long day's work or a busy week, you have that glass of whiskey to unwind. Uh, to connect, you're out with friends. So of course, you're out, you're having drinks, you're having cocktails, you're enjoying yourself. Obviously, to energize, it's probably more shot-based. And then the other three, the impress, indulge, and explore, is really where we get into Liberty's territory. So um, to impress, obviously, maybe to gift, uh, to explore, to try something a little bit irreverent and different that you mightn't have tried, 
like one of our whiskies is finished in Tokai, a Hungarian indigenous dessert wine. That's exploration as far as I'm aware. And uh, what was the last one? Um, the the indulge. So try, you know, spoiling yourself, trying that's something that you wouldn't necessarily try. So within the range, I think we're trying to cover off each and every one of those as we go. I think we've done that quite successfully. So the first two are really accessible price point wise and everything else. It's your everyday whiskey. And we wanted to at the time create a premium blended whiskey. And blended whiskeys often get a bad rep, but I think that you can, if you get it right, you know, there's a real art to blending whiskey. And, and this is 70% uh, malted, sorry, that's a lie. This is 70% grain and it's 30% malt whiskey. Now the 70% of this is actually eight year old, but the 30% is five year old. And that's why it's a five year old blend. Okay, so when you try the Oak Devil whiskey, there's a tremendous amount of character there's this great combination of complexity, but also simplicity in it as well. Uh, the, the phrase Christmas cake gets overused in Irish whiskey, and indeed in whiskey a lot. So I won't quite say it's like Christmas cake, but if you can imagine Christmas cake that was infused with green chilies, then you'd be talking about the Oak Devil, okay? So I always say two things when I do a whiskey tasting. Rule number one, everything you know about Irish whiskey is wrong. Rule number two, Forget how you would taste whiskey and indulge my tasting technique. And if it doesn't work for you, tell me at the end. But bear with me on this, okay? Because whiskey is super sensorial. And what I want to do is elongate each one of those aspects. People rush in and they deep dive in their nose and they drink. There's a much wider aspect to this. I'm looking at doing a tasting with five whiskeys in the future uh, where you eliminate one sense per whiskey, okay? So if I took away your sense of taste, how would you enjoy it? If I took away your sense of touch, how would you enjoy it? Okay, so all of these things we want to uh, accentuate, basically, and it'll all improve the overall experience. So, whiskey number one, the Oak Devil. So what I want you to do first things first is pick up the glass, so that's our touch. We have our lovely Tua glasses um, that are Irish, Irish made glasses here, and they provide a, a great uh, reverb of flavor and everything else. So, number one is touch, number two is sight. Okay, so what we're looking for is color, um, obviously normally by the cast and also if you just give it a gentle roll what's left is these kind of tears or legs of the whiskey and if they're thin sorry the thinner and slower they fall it's indicative of an oilier most likely an older whiskey uh, and if they're very thick and they're very fast it's normally a much younger whiskey and as I said 70% of this is eight years old so you do get quite a mix of sort of thin lines gently caressing down the side of the glass all right Next is nosing, and for me nosing is a kind of three or four step process. So the first thing I want you to do is just nose from about a couple of inches away from the nose, gently shaking the glass. So just trying to pick up some of those subtle spices, some of those subtle fruits. This has all been matured in American bourbon barrels exclusively, no additional finishing or anything else. Secondly, I want you to bring it a little bit closer, nose it again, and now I want you to open your mouth and nose it again. And you create a flow of air onto the back of the palate and you start to taste this, that little bit more of the brain starts going, wow, okay, I can actually get this sort of raisins and mixed peel and fruit and spice. So, my favorite one is the last part of this. I want you to put your hand over the very top of the glass. All right, so initially we shaked the glass gently and we got some aromas. What we're gonna do now is shake it aggressively. And we're gonna shake and we're gonna shake and we're gonna shake. And what we're doing here is trapping the aromas in the glass so that when I remove my hand, I let the whiskey breathe for about a second and then I nose it again. And you tell me what you experience. A big punch in the face. Yeah. No, a real blast really, really of flavor. Powerful, yeah, yeah, really powerful. So whiskey, of course, is quite volatile. So what happens is as you agitate the whiskey, the aromas carry up. And if you trap that in a glass, then you get a better idea of what you're about to taste. Mm -hmm. Cool thing with whiskey is, um, and the brain more so, when the brain starts to think about food, it starts to salivate. What does saliva have? Amylase. What does whiskey have? Maltose. What does amylase do? It breaks that down. So two things happen. You'll naturally dilute this better, and you'll also taste the sweetness more, which are two things we want to do in whiskey. So um, when people take a shot of whiskey, they say, oh, birds, I don't like it. That's because you haven't diluted it down naturally, and also you haven't broken down any of the flavor profiles. So you're literally just tasting alcohol. Yeah, my mouth is definitely watering. Yeah, I know, it's incredible, right? Yeah. So, we're on, we've done, so that's nosing. Yeah. And all of the time, we've just taken it step by step by step by step. Right? Next bit is the tasting. Now, it's 12.30 in the afternoon, 
Um, this is my first sip of neat alcohol today. Hopefully it's your first sip of neat alcohol today. Neat, yes. Liqueur. No. Liqueur, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, what, I know, what I want people to do is not get too bogged down by flavor, right? Because whiskey tastings, you can get like, oh, pencil shavings and charcoal and all this sort of stuff. First sip, you're going to taste alcohol. And that's the green chili spice that I was talking about. So, slant it, just take a little sip. Don't think about it too much. Right, alcohol, chilies, great. Beautiful thing about the palate is it adapts, right? Like humans, we adapt. Palate adapts as well. When you try this the next time, I want you to hold it in there for about five or six seconds. Let your palate do the work. Don't swirl it around like mouthwash, but like gently chew it as if it was a toffee sweet in the back of your throat, in the back of your palate. Um, what you'll do is you'll break it down. You'll get this kind of really transcendent, real transcendent difference between the spice that you had initially and this kind of cinder toffee and sweet caramel element that you get uh, on the second try. So we go again. Yeah. And you'll see what I mean. There's a kind of much more malty, fruity element. That sweetness comes through, and then there's that little kick of spice at the back end mm. as well. Cool thing, always when I do a whiskey toast, whiskey tasting, I start with the toast and I end with a toast. Right? So we'll start with a toast. So we'll say, um, you know, Irish people are very good at toasts, I hope. Right? So we'll say, um, may your neighbors respect you, trouble and neglect you, the oak devil protect you, and the liberties accept you. So, cheers so, to that. Cheers to that. <laughs> cool. Next is Copper Alley. Now, Copper Alley is named after one of the oldest streets in Dublin. Uh, there's a coin minted on it, and it's no longer actually in Dublin, but if you were to go down Dame Street and walk towards Trinity College, right beside Christchurch Cathedral, there's a left turn called Fish Amble Street, there's a pub called Darkie Kelly's, and right beside that you would have found the traditional, um, traditional Copper Alley. Now, Back in the day, the old Irish people were very religious, and the Liberties is full of cathedrals, and there's two cathedrals, Christ Church and St. Patrick's, there's plenty of gigantic churches, St. Aidan's Church is just an example of that, and they would have gone to Mass religiously, without cliches and all that. So, uh, if you've got lots of people travelling down one particular street, and these people were coming from the wealthy part of Dublin, the Pale, it was known as, if you've got loads of wealthy people walking down a street, to go to mass every other day what do you put there bars gambling dens and most importantly for darky kelly brothels so it became known as the most sort of infamous lane and it was where the cream of society and the everyday working man shared their many vices and we wanted to kind of honor that legacy once again uh, you can walk down that street and you can see the copper alley hotel and a copper alley bistro uh, once again so a lot of these stories are being revived once again now with Irish whiskey and indeed world whiskey, people are moving away from aged single malts and non-aged statements, and, and we don't want to do that. And we want to make sure that people can see there's a stamp of quality on, on our Liberties whiskey. So with Copper Alley, we have matured this initially in American bourbon casks, but we're trying to be innovative and we're trying to stand out. So one of the things we've done is find, well, source, Daryl, our master distiller, who I'll talk about in a second, has sourced 30-year-old first fill Oloroso sherry butts. So these are 500 litre barrels uh, imported directly from the bodega in Jerez in Spain. They're 30 years old, meaning that they've literally been constantly used for 30 years, previously only ever barreling sherry cast, sherry, Oloroso sherry. So there's a, 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 it's the seven sherries that are used in, in maturation, uh, Fino being the driest, and of course uh, Pedro Jimenez being the, the sweetest. I would say Oloroso probably fits just off center left of that in terms of sort of dryness. So it's probably more nutty that you'll get from, from this experience. Now, 30 years old, obviously there's a tremendous amount of flavor. First fill is the big one here, okay? Most people won't tell you where their sherry barrels are from or where, how, what age they are or how often they've been used. And one of the things I like to do with whiskey is demystify it, but also be super transparent with people. So uh, you can see from the color here, tremendous amount of flavor and sorry you can't see flavor from your eyes but what you can see is tremendous amount of color has been imparted from those barrels now the, given their age we can only use them twice really to get that kind of quality uh 
recurring in, in batches. So there's only about 12,000 bottles of Copper Alley, and when it's gone, it's actually gone. Um, batch one, we did six and a half months maturation, and batch two, there's actually been about 13 months maturation in those, in those Oloroso sherry casks. Now, Copper Alley, as I said to you earlier, was, was my second day when we launched this. It was previously in a, in a short black bottle, and we've then changed that into these clearer bottles to showcase the liquid. Crazily enough, none of this is available in the US. We're actually launching into the United States, into indeed North America, um, spring next year. That's our, that's our goal. Uh, the US is, a, is, a, is a, obviously a huge market for Irish whiskey, but we want to do it in the right way, and uh, we don't want to rush into to anything. So our Dubliner whiskies are available there, but, but Liberties has been somewhat of a, a slow wait and do it the right way. You get one chance to launch, we want to make sure that we, we nail it first time around so cop rally for me sorry i'll actually go back a step oak devil is your is your connect whiskey for me mm-hmm. cop rally is your unwind whiskey right this is like you're coming in from a long night a long day's work uh tough tough week uh this is something that is so accessible in terms of price and you can really get into and indulge and enjoy so it's believe it or not whiskey as well like i try and incorporate some sort of we're very, very gastro conscious nowadays. Everyone's super gastro conscious. We often don't associate whiskey with food, whereas we could and we should. And this whiskey pairs phenomenally well with, with smoky cheeses, like an applewood cheddar, smoked gouda, anything like that. You'll get a great balance of kind of smoke and cream with this kind of sweet cheese, uh, sorry, sweet and, and nutty whiskey as well. So what I'd like you to do is, in your own time, delve in, taking on the same nosing technique, of course, that I showed you now, and here you'll get that Oloroso sherry. So it is quite floral. Mm. There is that kind of burst vanilla pod sort of essence coming through. And I'll tell you, take a little small sip. And what I love here is, well, people tell you different things. Someone once told me that it smelled, it, aroma was like their granny's damp basement, which, I was like, is that an insult? He's like, no, 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 no. But do you know what I mean? And I said, actually, I, I kind of do know what you mean. The old barrels have left this sort of musty quality. And, and then on the, on the, on the mouthfeel, on the, on, the, on the actual palate, I get this, someone said biscotti biscuits to me before, mm. which is way too posh. So I say custard creams. So you get that like cereal, malty, biscuity element. This is double distilled. So you, when I spoke earlier in the distillation room about how it can be heavier and oilier, and it really coats like the cheeks, mm. the roof of the mouth. Everything is just layered and layered with flavor. So you get uh, custard creams or biscotti biscuits. You get that rich vanilla. You get this almost sort of, um, for me, it's like a walnut kind of nuttiness to it. And then the end bit is the best because it's just in here in the center of the chest. So it's a real winter warmer of a whiskey for me. And it's super accessible and I love it. It's definitely more mellow in the mouth. Yeah. yeah. The other one's and like silky. fiery. Yeah. It can be fiery. This is like uh, silky and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the most mm-hmm. awarded whiskies we have. So uh, it d- double gold medal in the International Spirits Challenge. It won a gold medal in the w- Irish Whiskey Masters and um, by the spirits business as well. So, you know, what we're trying is all gold medal award winning stuff. Um, we're, not, we're not shy of telling people that. And one of the great things in Irish whiskey is there is a renaissance. Right? There's, no, there's no excuse in that. Sorry, there's no denying that. And in 2011, there was three distilleries on the island of Ireland, which is crazy. We were, we, we were the 25th. There's now 27 open distilleries. There's plans for another 20. So we could be nearly projected to 50 distilleries, which is incredible. But just let that in for a minute, right? There's three whiskey distilleries in 2011. So essentially, there were three or four or five distillers who really grasped what Irish whiskey was. Well, we got one of them. Our master distiller is a man called Daryl McNally, and he's been in the Irish whiskey business now for over 20 years. He worked at Bushmills for 17 of those years, and he was one of, if, I think he was the head distiller, if not one of the head distillers. And in fact, he is a master distiller of Irish whiskey. Uh, an Irish man, an Irish whiskey master distiller. So it's fantastic for us as a young company to have one of what I call the OGs of, of Irish whiskey. Um, so he imparts a tremendous amount of knowledge, utilizes his contacts to ensure that we have sourcing the best wood, sourcing you know, some of the best whiskey available on the market as well, because we only opened in February, and we're drinking 
16, 13, 10, 27 year old whiskey, which we have sourced from, um, from various other distilleries around the island of Ireland. And what I always say to people is, you know, there, uh, there's an art in blending, there's an art in finishing. People are sourcing whiskey like we are, but they're not winning the same awards that we are. But then obviously we're doing something additional here to, to what we're buying in. So that's, that's hugely, uh, hugely beneficial as well. So hopefully what you found there is like your everyday whiskey, really and truly. It's a nightcap whiskey, it's an after dinner whiskey. You know, in my house, people break out, bot actually not in my house, but in other houses, people break out a bottle of wine when they have dinner parties uh, and they get four glasses out of a bottle and then it's gone. If you're lucky to get four glasses. Uh, in my house, we break out bottles of whiskey and I, my friends like don't really get whiskey, but they're learning because I'm showing them, you know, this nosing technique, these tasting techniques pairing it with a variety of different stuff and they're starting to appreciate it more as, as a body of flavor and like what I always tell people is try whiskey neat and then add whatever you need to so there's no problem with adding water or ice cranberry juice whatever you want like and I'll say this again in the podcast later but I worked in a, in a private country club in Florida for a year and the guys would come in from around it was like super wealthy like these people were the one percent like the one percent you know um, and they would come in from around the golf and they would order a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label and they'd say, and they'd sit out by the fire pit and smoke cigars and they'd say, Jeff, do you know what? Can we also have a couple of cranberry juices and sprites and a thing of ice and we're gonna mix it? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, fine, I'll do what you wanna do. But what I've never shown, heard of cranberry and, cranberry and Cranberry and Sprite and then, and then um, and Johnny Walker Blue. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that was, their, that was their go-to in the hot Floridian sun. And it was just funny because I was like, you know, like that's a $400 bottle of whiskey. <laughs> uh, but people will drink whatever way they want and my only goal is for you to taste it neat and then go from there so what I would like to ask you to do as well is to keep a little bit of Copper Alley because our last whiskey our second last whiskey is uh, Keeper's Coin it's also finished in Sherry so we'll compare the two okay. Sherry's um, next third whiskey is Murder Lane with a 13 is unlucky for some uh, Murder Lane, more unlucky for others. It's named after a place called Murdering Lane, which was uh, right beside the 40 Steps to Hell. Again, all parts of, of Dublin's famed history. Uh, there was actually only 39 steps, but they called it the 40 Steps to Hell. And you can still walk down the 40 Steps to Hell as well. And then, where does hell lead? Liberties. Um, the story goes that many people met, miss, like, met their fate on this hill. To be honest, my personal opinion is that because there were so many bars around the area, and people were very, very drunk that they probably fell down the 40 steps and uh, that's, how they they, ended they, that's, how they, yeah, that's how they ended in hell. So I talked earlier about how we were going to be innovative within the category and, and, and various other types of oak are becoming really, really popular. And Irish whiskey has a legislate that we have to follow. And one of the great things that it allows for a variety of different woods, a variety of different oaks, a variety of different everything else. So what we've done is we sourced Hungarian oak barrels, 225 litre barrels that previously held Tokai dessert wine. Now, for those of you who don't know, Tokai is an indigenous dessert wine. Uh, it's protected in the same way Champagne's provenance is protected in France. So there's a lot of rules and regulations around it. It's T-O-K-A-J, Tokai. Uh, it comes from the Hungarian kind of hills, mountains in the, in the upper west part of, um, in, of Hungary. And what it imparts in our whiskey here is this incredible tropical element, right? Um, dessert wines, of course, the, the word dessert wine imparts in the head sweetness. Um, but when you try this, there's this robust kind of coconut, marzipan, pineapple, ripe banana quality that, uh, that shines through spectacularly here. So um, what I ask you to do is don't rush this one because it's, it's, it's a personal favorite of mine. A little bit more expensive than, uh, than, a, than a brand ambassador can afford on a daily basis, but one to certainly enjoy when you get the chance to. So cheers. You can smell it right away. Yeah. So that was about six and a half months in these Tokai barrels. And as I said, triple distilled, so it's definitely lighter. It's not as oily and in your mm -hmm. face as the previous whiskey, but it's that absolute delicate subtleties. Initially, on the palate, it's stone fruits, it's, mm -hmm. it's peaches, it's um, peaches, and, uh, blah, 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 peaches and plums. No, peaches and apricots is what I'm thinking of, sorry. Peaches and apricots, and then that kind of tropical quality just bounces through, mm -hmm. and the, the, it kind of just keeps going and going and going, going down, 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 down. So tremendous, tremendous whiskey. 
uh, tasted this recently and the whole table were just like mind completely blown. We were the first Irish whiskey company to ever use Tokai barrels. And as I said, we're exploring other indigenous dessert wines, indigenous mm -hmm. wines around the world to see what they can do. Because uh, one of the things we are able to do is, is experiment. And the benefits of being a new whiskey company is that you have no heritage to abide by. So we can basically make it up as we go along. And uh, we've done that along the way with some of the beer cask stuff and with some of this stuff, but all the time producing quality. Like that's not what we want to do, you know, so. What do you think? It's fantastic. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It just changes the whole mindset of what Irish whiskey could be. And when you talked about food pairing, what would you suggest? With um, that one would be more... Uh, I did it with a... I actually did it with a sashimi, like yellowfin, mm. sort of tuna, and, um, and a lot of Japanese food because I think of that kind of tropical element and it worked very well. <laughs> so we're going to move into our 16 year old and one of the things for me on this is very few 16 year olds available in the Irish market. Um, what I forgot to say on the 13 year old and is the same for the 16 year old is that these are limited to 300 bottles for Ireland. Um, they're not available in the US, so we're not shipping 5,000 bottles to the US and then saying there's only 300 in Ireland. There is a really limited quantity for batch one, and they are individually batched. Um, just to give you an idea, batch two for the 13-year-old has been finished in the tote guy for 14 months. So it's going to taste very different. Um, batch one for Keeper's Coin, which is our 16-year-old, is uh, six to eight months in Pedro Jimenez Hogs Head casks that again have been sourced by Daryl, uh, personally went out to Spain and, and, and tried these. Um, and mm. Pedro Jimenez is the kind of grand daddy of all things sherry. It's, it's, it's the mac daddy of sherry, to be honest. So look at the color, like it's proper mm. auburn, you know? And there's a real luxury feel to this whiskey. Um, the Keeper's Coin is one mm. of the best stories that we have. It originates from the fact that Christchurch Cathedral, which is ever present in the Liberties and in Dublin, has an underground to it. it used to be a market, okay? However, this is like where the original speakeasies came from. These guys had bars behind their markets. So in order to get access to these bars, you had to have a coin from the innkeeper. So the keeper's coin. Now, when they were excavating Christchurch Cathedral, they found these coins and they found leather pouches with alcohol in them. And so that's how they discovered that they were like basically the original speakeasy bars and how to do it. Now, we've tried to get some coins, but they're... Uh, not, not, not going to give the Irish uh, museums aren't going to give us any coins, unfortunately. So, again, it's a part of the Liberty's history. It's a part of the story. It's something that we want to emphasize to people. So, this is, um, it's basically like pure jam. It's that stickiness. It's got like a smoked. I don't even know. It's, a, it's like a smoked meats quality. That's bizarre. And then, I, I always remember thinking. I think of like apple and rhubarb and berry crumble the dessert but in, in liquid form okay you couldn't come to a whiskey distillery without trying what we actually make so this is our new make spirit uh, it came off the stills at 84.6 percent alcohol by volume and then we would naturally dilute this to 63 however this is actually diluted to 47 percent and the reason for that is that we won't be putting this in a barrel we won't be aging it we will be selling our new make spirit, uh, and it's going to be called Toos. Toos is the Irish word for beginning, and this is the beginning of our whiskey journey, so that people can get a look and a feel for what our flavor profile will be. And a lot of what I said in the distillation house was about light and floral, and when I was sold the vision of the company when I joined, that's what Daryl said to me, that this is going to be what we're going to do. And I was like, how are you going to do that? Like, you're telling me this now. And now you're in there, you're smelling it, and you're seeing it, and now you get to taste it. So, um, this is 100% malted barley, triple distilled. There's a rawness to it, but in a good way. There's like this aniseed, lemon. Again, I'll let you explore it yourself, but the real quality that shines through here is the cereal. So, for me, I get like a, a digestive biscuit kind of vibe. Chocolate digestive biscuits, toasted malt, everything that's good about it, and then, yeah 
dive it's in. It's so floral. So the smell floral. is so yeah. good. So malty, so floral. And we've had a lot of people say it's the best new mixed fruit they've ever tried. So no pressure on us to produce good whiskey. What we're trying lastly is King of Hell. Now the King of Hell is a man called Richard Parsons who was famed in the Liberties area for being somewhat of an anarchist. Uh, they weren't a violent group per se. They more sort of poked fun at the uh, high cream of society or the top brass of society so to speak. So they had a saying that was do as thou wilt um, which is something that we've adopted here in the Liberties uh, as well. And we wanted to bring a little bit of attention to our King of Hell. Now, this is an exceptionally rare bottling. Um, there's only 50 bottles available in the world. Uh, there are only five left uh, as well. They, they go for 2,700 euro per bottle. And what makes this whiskey so unique is that it's, again, some of the oldest available in Ireland. But we have finished this in Premier Cru Bordeaux red wine barrels. For those of you that don't know anything about Bordeaux red wine, shame on you. However... There are only five vineyards in the Premier Crew uh, capacity and we have partnered up with one of them who we cannot name um, for risk of being sued heavily. So what I will say is they're very, very difficult to get uh, to work with. Sorry, that's a lie. They're not very difficult to work with. They're very difficult to get barrels from. So again, because of Daryl and his capabilities, we've been able to source barrels that most people would not be able to get. Um, what I will say to you on this is you're trying a piece of whiskey history. Uh, this is some of the oldest stuff available and I won't, I won't tell you anything. I'm not even going to tell you anything on tasting notes. Just appreciate the fact that there's Bordeaux red wine meets Irish whiskey and it's just a match made in heaven. So we start with a toast and we end with a toast. So here's to cheat. You're in the Liberties, which as I told you already was hell. So full of, was it rebels, rascals and raconteurs. So here's to cheating, stealing, fighting and drinking. And if you cheat, may you cheat death. If you steal, may you steal your lover's heart. If you fight, may you fight for a brother. And when you drink in the Dublin Liberties, may you drink another. So, sláinte. Sláinte to everyone at the Dublin Liberties Distillery for making these episodes happen. A huge thank you and happy holidays to all of them and to all of you who continuously support Lush Life. Without you, there would be no Lush Life. I couldn't leave you without a cocktail of the week, now could I? Are you ready to make a measure of attitude with the Dead Rabbit Irish Whiskey? That's our cocktail of the week, so you better be. Pour all of the following ingredients into a mixing glass. 50 ml of Dead Rabbit Irish Whiskey. A teaspoon of Merlet Creme de Peche. 8 ml of Benedictine and two dashes of the Bitter Truth Cherry Thomas Decanter Bitters. Stir them down before serving in a tumbler glass with a block of ice. Then express a lemon peel over top and discard the peel. Then toast to 2020 with a modern day old fashioned. You can find this recipe, more Irish whiskey recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. This holiday will be a time to enjoy my father as he slips slowly into the clutches of Alzheimer's. After a lifetime of helping people as a breast cancer surgeon, he's now needing help from others. I'll be on hand to make his favorite a Bloody Mary, but for my mom and me, there's only whiskey and eggnog. If you live for Lush Life, would you consider supporting us by buying us a coffee? Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash lushlife and you can donate once or monthly to make sure we are still here every Tuesday. Also, you know how much I love to talk about cocktails and we can all be together talking on the flick.group slash lushlife app. It's free to join and works on Android and iOS devices. Plus, you can listen to the latest episodes right there if you want to catch up. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro, who, by the way, is my cousin, and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. I couldn't do it without him. Which leads me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. 
and always drink responsibly. Okay, you know the second part was mine. We are suckers for punishment and heading off to snowy, cold Chicago to try aviary and all the other fabulous bars there over the holidays. Be safe and see you in 2020. Until then, as always, bottoms up.